All righty. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to today's session in our mid-career conversation series. Uh, today's session is titled, What the Tech? Leading in a Post-Hype Era, featuring storyteller Melissa romulus Lisanti. My name is Leanne Kazanchi, and I will be your host for today. Um, and I'd like to extend a big and warm welcome to all of you. Um, I know some of you, I'm noticing some names are uh, repeat attendees, so welcome back. And some, I think, are attending for the first time. So welcome to the Mid-Career Conversation series. A little bit about the program. Um, essentially, it's a program that features a mid-career alumni storyteller that shares their own journey and highlights from their career. Um, throughout the session, and you'll see, you'll be able uh, to, to ask questions, and, and uh, there's an opportunity to, to network towards the end of the uh, the end of the the end of the event. Uh, now, as this event is virtual, and since we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize the following land acknowledgement might not necessarily be for the territory you are currently on. If that's the case, please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. The website native-land.ca is a great resource for you, and I believe we're going to populate that in the chat shortly. Awesome. As a member of the York University community, I recognize many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the, on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tecoronto has been taken care of, has been taken by the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. The Mid-Career Conversation series was created with alumni like you in mind to connect, hear each other's stories, uh, and hear experiences that, that other alumni are, are going through. You'll also be able to ask questions as mentioned and share your own unique journey and ambitions. Today will be a special opportunity for us to come together as York alumni and share our stories and experiences. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Leanne Pizanchi. I'm your host for, for today's session, also a York U alumna. Uh, I received my BA in communications in 2015 from York. Um, I then went on to do postgrad, uh, a, a, post, a postgrad certificate in uh, public relations and corporate comms, uh, a master's in digital marketing and an MBA. Um, I currently work at TD Bank Group, supporting our CEO with communications and public affairs. For today's conversation, our storyteller will deliver a 20 minute talk. Uh, and afterwards, we will take some questions for you. And I know a couple were submitted uh, during registration, so we'll get to those as well. Um, as always, we ask that your comments be relevant and respectful um, and, and, and feel free to use the chat button and send, send those questions into me as soon as you, as you think of them. Uh, feel free to also use the chat to let us know where you are tuning in from. After the Q&A, we're going to stop recording and move into breakout rooms for about 10 minutes for the networking portion of the event, after which we'll return uh, back to the main room for final remarks. Um, you are encouraged to have your video on so that we can see each other and for the storyteller to see you. However, this is entirely optional. Um, lastly, please do consider editing your screen name to include your first name, your last name, your preferred pronouns, your degree, and your grad year. So for example, for myself, Leanne Kazanchi, she, her, uh, BA 2015. Uh, and you can do this by clicking rename in the Zoom menu. Without further ado, I'm super excited to welcome our storyteller for today, Melissa romulus Lisanti. Melissa is a highly accomplished professional with over 18 years of experience leading complex businesses and digital transformations. She creates order out of chaos and empowers individuals to fulfill their part of an organization's strategy. As Director of Strategy and Operations in the Digital, digital Data and Innovation Office at PwC, Melissa is currently leading the Gen AI transformation and the enablement of the innovation mandate by amplifying strategy, structure, and operations to drive growth, in addition to building and enabling highly performing teams. She also facilitates, coaches, and mentors the Women in Leadership Professional Development Program at PwC. Melissa has a proven track record as a high-performing executive with passion for organizational transformation in the public, parapublic, and private sectors. She holds designations in change management, project management, and leadership coaching, and is a proponent of continuous development to achieve strong professional performance. Welcome, Melissa. Super thrilled to have you. 
Thank you for having me, Leanne. It's such a great honor um, to be chatting with York alumni. York uh, has played such a pivotal role in my life and, and happy to get into my story. And I also invite people to interact with me. It's, I don't, I can't see very many people, but if uh, you are able to put your camera on, it helps me know if I'm doing well, not well, <laughs> you know. Uh, so feel free to share some emojis or uh, any reactions in the chat or, and I'm happy I'm not distracted by it, I love it. So a little bit about me. Um, when I was asked to do this, I was reflecting, I'm like, wow, York feels like so long ago. I graduated in 08 um, and I actually was a part-time student for the back half of my my um, my degree, which I bemoaned for a while. But I have to say that um, I had a really pivotal conversation with one of our politicians in residence. I actually was at Glendon College, Glendon, which is York's bilingual campus, the the cousin campus across Toronto, and um, I had a chance to have a really great conversation with David Colinette who was the Minister of Defense who landed all the planes during 9-11, just to give you that context. And there's a master's program uh, at Glendon, and he was one of the founding um, the founding minds uh, and thought leadership going into that school. And I was like, oh, you know, uh, because I'm an adult student and, um, you know, I don't get to do all the fun things that undergrads do. And I'm working, I'm working full time and going to school part time. And he said, you know, you'll look back on this conversation and realize that having that work experience actually gives you a heads up. So I was, I started as a work study student uh, in undergrad, and then I started working full time in the uh, the dean's office or the principal's office uh, at Glendon. And so that's my connection to York U. I've since gone on um, to finish an MBA at Queens and Cornell Universities. It's a joint program. So happy to chat about uh, continuing education as being a working mom and a uh, busy executive. Um, so from leaving, leaving York, uh, it was one of my first full-time uh, roles that I was doing. I went into private sector, working uh, for a paper company. It's now called Kruger Inc. Um, and then I moved. Um, I moved to. I moved. I went back to London, and then I moved here to PwC. And I have to say, for any of you who work in Big Four, if anybody's on the call, uh, give me a thumbs up if you work for a consulting firm. It's sort of like post post grad. Uh, there are so many disciplines, so many things um, to experience, and then also being able to solve problems with and for clients in real time. Uh, and that has really opened up my mind to the business landscape here in Canada, both in uh, public sector, private sector, parapublic, because uh, we do serve academia as well. So having a really great time connecting and learning about the real needs. Uh, but what my true passion is, and thanks for the wonderful introduction, Leanne, is people, is making sure that people are engaged. And not only that, but making sure that we have uh, the leadership and the coaching and mentorship that fuels high performing teams. So that's what I wanted to to really center our time around today. I do have some slides, but if you have specific questions or you want me to go in a specific direction, please feel free to come off mute or put something in the chat um, if you want to, if you want me to, to answer anything specifically. Um, I have to say though that as a younger leader, now I'm not, I look young, but I'm not so young. I'm actually in that mid to upper range where um, people are coming into the workforce. I call them earlier career professionals who are saying things and working in ways that aren't really germane to how I grew up or when I had to sort of pay my dues and learn the way. So I, I felt it really appropriate for this group to talk about sort of where, like being in that sandwich generation, um, we have uh, leadership right now who are uh, retiring at a rapid pace, executive leadership. Um, and that's where I sit in the firm right now. Um, I sit in our C-suite team with uh, our organizational strategy and as well our operational strategy. And seeing, sitting with these leaders and understanding where, where they've come from and what they're used to. And uh, sometimes, and especially as with the advent of, of generative AI, uh, the answer is let's just hire young people. <laughs> so that's, that's something that many clients have done and, and certainly we have to a certain extent at PwC, but we really take the approach and really the respect of the multi-generational workforce that we find ourselves in. We've got five generations spanning this workforce right now. And so if you find yourself in situations and conversations where you have to do a lot of translating or, or shifting your mindset, this is the chat that I wanna have today. I also wanna put on the table uh, just you know every keynote, I think from uh, 
in the last two years to maybe I think we've got maybe a few more years window um, talking about the pandemic. The pandemic was a definite reset. I think what we learned, uh, especially from the leadership table, is that the workforce is important. Keeping the workforce engaged is important, but it's nebulous and it shifts constantly. We have um, people who are what we call the microwave generation, where they can order things at the drop of a hat and it, it arrives at their door at their doorstep within 30 minutes, a meal or same day Amazon delivery or, you know, things happen so quickly. What is their expectation as it pertains to the environment that they find themselves working in? And then that also begs the question, what type of leadership do high performing teams require, especially given the multi-generational aspect and also the microwave aspect of, I want things now, I want my promotion tomorrow. And, and I'm sure we've had those conversations where you have earlier career professionals or people who've been uh, in your firm or in your organization for mm, 15 minutes and they're ready for, you know, they, they're ready for prime time and saying like, put me in. So I think it's about, conversations and it's about understanding uh, expectations, but also it comes right back down to your mindset. Who are you as a person? How do you show up? What is your intention um, in terms of serving and being a servant leader? Are you leading with um, care? Are you leading with intentionality? Are you leading with that big picture thinking? And I also have to caveat here that um, I make a clear distinction in my work with clients and also within the firm that management is not leadership. I'll say it again, management is not leadership. What do I mean by that? It's that a manager is someone who has become proficient, or I'll say technical expertise, not technological, but technical expertise, um, who has become good at doing the job they were hired to do and that now oversees other people doing that same job. I see a manager as someone who checks the boxes of a job description and makes sure that an employee's day-to-day -day work is organized, is on time, is within budget, and is done with quality. A leader is someone who inspires, who directs, who navigates, who designs a strategy and brings people in. They, they are the ones who get to see that big picture. They wake up thinking about it and they draw people into it. And so I want to make that distinction because... Um, in many cases, uh, managers become uh, leaders, sorry, managers become leaders and they don't know how to make that shift over. And so during the pandemic, uh, I just wanna tell a really quick story is that the team that I was on, I had to do a few pivots. So I, I'm in technology and we decided to build products to help our clients navigate, you know, the government funding that was available to them uh, in, in the pandemic to, suppl to supplement some of the income that they were losing and also to help clients just keep their businesses open during the pandemic. And um, I had a leader that we worked with who was of the mindset that, you know, if we load people up with work and we keep them very busy and we just have meetings with them all the time and then we can know that they're productive and that we can um, make sure that nobody's worried and we're not losing time and we're not losing momentum. And they ended up turning the volume up from about a seven to a 12, where people were actually experiencing burnout. So we've heard of Zoom fatigue and meeting fatigue, but this was just very eye-opening to watch. And knowing that, you know, my inner leadership nerd is just like, something's not right. Like something's not right. I think this leader might be manifesting their desire to make sure that everybody's okay, but it's coming out the wrong way. And so that's where, you know, I really honed in on my, my new word, which is intentionality, which is leading with intent. And um, I've got resources if anybody wants to message me about that, but it's this beautiful, beautiful recipe for sharing the intended outcome of an event or project or, or a certain next step in a direction, and then leaving people the room to, um, to grow. So I challenged that thinking a little bit with the like loading up people and, and keeping them busy, because I was seeing the, the after effect um, that, that that had on, on staff that were sort of that were reporting into me saying like, when do we get a break? And, you know, we didn't even have time to do those really fun like Zoom socials and, you know, the, the, the pandemic busters or whatever you call them. So I started looking at it a different way. So how could we solve for productivity? How could we solve for engagement? How could we think differently about how the intent, the, the, the environment that we create for our staff 
um, using technology. So I'm going to share my screen and I just want to share with you some thinking um, for you to have in your mind. Just one second. I think this is working. Can someone give me a thumbs up if they can see this or come off mute? You're good. We can see it. Yeah, yeah it looks good. Yeah. Sorry, and then the other part of the setup that I clearly am not looking at my notes uh, is that I am knee deep in Gen AI transformation, like Gen AI all day, every day, um, and helping clients figure out, you know, you know that big question is like, what's going to happen given that about forty percent of our productivity can be gained through AI tools being inserted in the flow of work daily, and also um, for those of you who are in knowledge work. That means that about 80% of the jobs and tasks that exist today could go away in the next 24 months. Yeah, that's so things are moving so rapidly and I'm advancing the slide. We haven't seen anything yet. Today is the slowest pace of change that you're going to experience in your professional life. I'm not saying that to scare anybody. I'm just saying that we, if you, this leaning in and being intentional about embracing this technology, embracing the change that's coming. Some people are treating generative AI and AI tools as um, a technology insertion into a stack that will help people work a little bit better. But I would posit that it's actually going to re cause us to reimagine business models. And so I say that from a place of, if people have new tools to solve problems, that means that the way that we look at problems are gonna change. That also means that the type of people solving the problem is going to change and the type of organizations that exist to help people solve problems. And that's what businesses exist to do is solve a problem for a target market and uh, generate revenue on that. So I don't know where my screen went. Did my screen go black? Uh, we can still see it. I can't see it, just one. <laughs> We can see the, we ain't seen nothing yet slide right now. Okay, just checking to see if I did something. Just two seconds, sorry. No worries, take your time, Melissa. So, uh, Just went black. So sorry. Just two seconds. Okay. This yeah. should work. Okay, here we go. So I want to talk to you about two humans. Traditional Tom. Uh, traditional Tom is a leader who relies on in-person meetings and phone calls and picks up the phone when something goes wrong or just assumes that people are available um, and, and equates productivity with uh, presence, like you have to be there. So Tom's daily routine involves face-to-face -face meetings with team members and stakeholders and saying, let's get everybody in a room and let's, uh, let's brainstorm. So think about Tom as someone who's been in a leadership position and has, has gotten to where they are because of, I wanna say traditional or recognized uh, leadership practices, meaning like the, the, the uh, all hands meeting and like the 10 at 10 or the nine at nine, whatever you prescribe to and is a little bit leery about technology being like, uh, AI, it's cute. It's like gonna help us work a little bit better, but that's for the young kids or that's for the young folks. And I say that, I sound ageist, but believe it or not, clients are saying that to us and saying, oh, the, like we'll give that tool to the, to the juniors. And I actually believe it's a proxy that they're a little bit scared about how to uh, adopt AI, but um, I'm not here to preach about AI, just about uh, leading in a post AI world. Um, so Tom believes in a top-down leadership approach that there's a hierarchy that decisions are made at a boardroom and then disseminated and people fall into place. And also, like I said, um, reserves communication for phone calls, face-to-face -face meetings, and 
like let's have a conversation about things instead of disseminating information that way. So I'm sure we all know a traditional Tom, they're probably high functioning, uh, high uh, aspiration humans who are doing well for themselves. I don't, I'm not hating on him. I'm just saying that this is a persona that does exist. But here's innovative Ivy. Okay. So think about, think about, you know, where people could be going and has a very open, open mindset about technology, AI, and how to create that right environment for a high performing team. Ivy embraces new technologies and innovative approaches, questions things and wonders what problems are we solving um, in the flow of work or for with and for a client rather than deciding um, where to go and, uh, and adopts a leadership style of collaborative approach. Okay, this Ivy is open to new perspectives, maybe might send um, a, an anonymous poll or a form for people to gather insights and ideas and make sure that there's not just one brain around a problem involves other people, but lets them participate in their own comfort zone. Communication style, broad range. Ivy's team maybe is a hybrid, maybe has um, is a fully remote team, or maybe it's an in-person team, but leverages communication, uh, le leverages technology, technology as a communication tool to alleviate meeting fatigue or maybe to, to promote asynchronous, so out of the flow of work or out of the day-to-day um, -day nine to five, have people uh, opine on or give suggestions and ideas on a piece of work outside of meetings. And their motivation strategy is personalized. They collect data or they they lead in such a way that they can morph their personality styles, um, their leadership style, sorry, to the different personalities on the team. And finally, Ivy's approach to technology is let's try it. Um, failing fast, uh, be, having a beginner's mindset, jumping into things and saying, maybe this might work, maybe it won't work, but you know, I'm with you team and, and jumping into um, efficient efficiency and driving that with the team. Ivy's tools may include using Slack or Microsoft Teams for real-time messaging, might give updates or share action items uh, in a chat. They might use Trello or Asana for project management. And if you don't, I'm not, um, I don't represent any of these companies. So these are just ideas. Uh, also a caveat, uh, these are just tools that some people meet, use. Um, Keeping track of work, if you all know um, Kanban or Scrum methodology, having like a task board where we know who's working on what, when it's due, and something that people can pull information from and add to without needing another meeting or an update or a status meeting, just everything in real time. Might use Zoom or Microsoft Teams for virtual meetings like we're doing right now, uh, and maybe have some more uh, personal or um, more concentrated time uh, for the more personal conversation. So I'm saying maybe a performance review would be done face-to-face -face, or a, a phone call or something that's a little bit more personal. Um, their routines in, include, uh, Ivy's routines include check-ins with, with team members via digital channels. It could be a text, it could be a call. And for those of you who prescribe to different personality uh, or strengths indexes. So there's the strengths deployment um, index that really tells you what kinds of people you have on your team. I have a methodology whereby I identify who are my very analytical people who might be a little bit more prone to um, receiving data a certain way, maybe in writing, they don't want a phone call, they don't want to meet, they want to read. Or you have more relational colleagues who prefer the conversation and, and uh, in-depth discussion. So understanding what kinds of check-ins, what kind of interactions jive with most. And then having regular virtual touch points um, to discuss project team goals and brainstorm ideas and maybe would have a kickoff or a project close in person. But Ivy really is thinking about how best like which kind of connection means uh, would mean the most value to the right people in the right time. So it's a little bit more of thinking through what pertains to each person versus like a, a blanket solution. And finally, the use of data analytics, and that's where AI really comes to track team performance, to lead, to give indicators of team health. You know, um, there are tools now that exist whereby uh, you can see you can, you can navigate people engagement and sentiment in real time. 
And you know, are people showing up to meetings late? Are they double booked uh, often? Are people having wellness times or wellness breaks? There, there's technology that exists right now to help leaders lean into those kinds of goals. So I wanna jump into sort of comparing and contrasting different leadership skills that I think that we all have and need to hone even more so and some suggestion for uh, some AI suggestions for helping you hone those skills and put them to work day to day. So think about lead decision making as a leader. In times gone by, what I call old school thinking, some leaders may rely on their intuition or gut feel or been there, done that. And this is what we did with the last three clients. So it should be the same rather than a new school approach using AI driven predictive analytics to forecast trends or customer preferences the data exists everywhere. Um, there are databases, there are, um, you know, publicly available um, resources where um, in order to present maybe a solution to a client or even to an internal client or an internal stakeholder, you can say, you know, studies have shown or research has shown that people respond better to a four-day work week with this, 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 and this, rather than saying the people want a four-day work week. So helping decision making at different tables, whether you're, um, you know, reporting into someone or that you're sharing a change with a team, especially in the change management context of transformation, showing data really helps get the point across and removes the emotion uh, out of many of many a decision making and also some bias. So there are solutions that exist. Um, Salesforce has one. IBM has one, many um, different companies have them that will help generate those insights, even from your own data, whether it's structured or unstructured, and give you a feel for um, uh, what people are thinking and how consumer trends would play into a decision that you would potentially make. The next skill is critical thinking. Um, and back to the decision making, very close, but critical thinking is about looking at a problem from all angles and looking at what incongruencies might exist um, in, in a pattern of thinking or in, um, in a policy, for example. And in an old school approach, we would rely on personal expertise or um, you know, someone's experience um, or just one human's experience. And oftentimes we see that um, in organizations, the person, the people that we rely on for that critical thinking are people who have been able to assimilate information and sort of keep it not to themselves, but just um, become that go-to person, which I believe is a business risk, um, and in which is in um, opposition to some of the things that I, AI is allowing us to do now, which is create what I call col uh, collective intelligence, where we're putting everybody in the organization's um, experience, knowledge, and expertise into an LLM or in something that's 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 searchable for everyone and creating success for everyone and removing that business risk of having that one person who's always got the answer. So collaborating using AI-driven tools is the way to go. Um, also having data sets that are cleansed, that are ready to use, that were, um, and that might even look like uh, a good repository of lessons learned from a project that you can then go and mine and say, give me the last, you can ask a co-pilot or um, do a quick search and say, what are the, what are the last, the, the, the um, trends over the last three projects where this has failed? And then use that into your critical thinking as you're shaping and designing solutions for clients. So Tableau, Google Cloud, um, you know, Microsoft also has really great tools to do that, where you can take large volumes of data or even small buckets of unstructured data and mine that to help inform that problem solving lens. Then for team building, um, forming teams in the past has been like, let's look at people's skill sets, let's match them to where, where we think we might need them or and a lot of bias in hiring. I'll, and that's a whole other conversation but the types of people that get hired just on the basis of a really great LinkedIn page or a well-formatted resume um, and their first impression versus new school where you can actually take AI-driven analytics and you actually can do skill mapping using AI to say, given the demand that's coming into my organization or with a, a strategic project or something coming down the pipe from your organizational uh, plan, we know that we need these types of skill sets. And by indexing the people who are currently on your team and finding the gaps or hiring people with specific skill sets, you can match your demand and your supply 
um, using AI powered tools. Uh, HireVue is a great one that looks at applicant uh, data, also uses um, video to do a first screen and helps, and through the use of AI, helps the hiring manager um, see whether the types of people that are that are applying to roles are the right ones, or if the job description, conversely, is matching what uh, the the aspirational job description is matching the type of people that are applying. So, AI definitely builds into that, like how to build a, a complementary team, and I mean complementary in a way that strengths are are balanced and with organizational objectives. And um, communication. Uh, we, I spoke about this at the beginning. Um, it's a nebulous one in that communication means different things to different people, and people have different preferred methods of communication. So I don't want to I don't want to um, negate the power of email and meetings and saying that it's not great. It's just being able to figure out what kind of engagement you'll get with the right audience and given the right situation. There are times where calling an all hands meeting because it's a critical. Uh, you know, a critical uh, incident or crisis and saying everybody needs to get on this call because this is the meeting. And I also don't mean that you have to um, pick and choose and be selective about and be worried about what kinds of meetings are effective and not. But what I'm saying here is that using AI um, and, you know, canned messages or timed messages or um, suggested language for different audiences is a way to enhance your communication style. It's a way to, to make sure that you're really answering the mail for each of your stakeholders um, in the right way. So using AI for communication, some people use AI to draft emails, some people use, them, uh, use AI to summarize meetings and make sure that the right action items are conveyed. And uh, as, as recently as yesterday, uh, we had an internal stakeholder ask um, ChatGPT to help him draft an introduction to a massive client meeting that they were holding just by having the right prompts, um, ensuring that all the communication points were covered. And finally, motivating, which is a leadership skill that sometimes gets forgotten um, and looking at how um, you can motivate a team. I believe that the success and failure of your team depends on um, a motivational leader. We all have had that leader that that sees you, that knows you, that really um, has dexterity to be able to be supportive, as well as leading from the front to be um, a good example for the team. So using, um, using AI in this case, I believe has to do with getting feedback, anonymous, not anonymous, and also giving feedback um, in a way to make sure that people understand what's expected of them and measure how they're doing against that in terms of their per, per, their performance. In times gone by, we would rely on, oh, so-and-so is in the office. They were here early or they stayed late. Therefore, you know, they're motivated and they're like, they're on track. But I would, I would suggest that a new school approach would be, let's use insights and like, what's the quality of the work? How timely are they, um, you know, how timely are they submitting um, deliverables? What kinds of impact does their work have and be able to measure that? And that might look like, um, you know, post event surveys or uh, debriefs with that, with um, stakeholders who've received your subordinates work or even your work, collating that feedback, visualizing it to say that here's the trend. When you, when you, when you are given these kinds of tasks, here's the response that you get and then use that to motivate high performance. Um, so I think I've gone over, but that's some of my tips and tricks uh, and I'll stop sharing. Awesome. So happy to receive any questions or comments or counter offers to anything that I just shared. Thanks so much for sharing that, Melissa. That was really awesome. And I, it, it made me think of, uh, when chat GPT first came about, um, I was having some a conversation with, with friends that work at uh, the, the bank I work at and, and a couple others. And it's so interesting to see how a lot of the top down, mentality or thinking is very much part of that old school thinking that that you showed um and there's almost this like immediate resistance you know we're definitely not going to go with that and it's not part of you know how we operate and we mm -hmm. don't want to it's it's a risk or it's a threat um but then it's like as time goes by and as that to your point like that influence and, and almost like showing them the, the data and benefit and how it's you know how it's actually not as scary as you think and you know there's there are more pros than cons and, and whatnot um it's interesting to see that shift sort of really slowly but eventually hopefully will happen yeah um, 
So thanks for sharing that. That was, that was really awesome. Absolutely. Just a little nugget on what you said. Um, I am finding, and I'm doing a lot of work with C-suite humans. So um, they like that. Okay. So they yeah. like the people who come in and put up their hand and say, so I've been observing this and I pulled some research and, and when things are backed with data, there's more openness to ideas. There's more openness to like, yeah, let's try that. Let's give that person a little bit of time and money to solve for yeah. that. I didn't know that was a problem. Thank you for letting <laughs> me know. It was so fire so once you show them the numbers or the bar graph or whatever. <laughs> right, right. Um, awesome. So let's open things up for questions. Um, please feel free to submit them in the chat, um, the chat uh, function. I While those are coming, yeah, they're good. They're, I think they're, I, I got a couple as well. While those are coming in, I did see one come through during registration, Melissa. So maybe you can start with that. Um, so we know that AI can improve productivity. Any advice on how we can convince our team of its value? <laughs> um, yes. So if, if, so I'm assuming the person's a leader and not, not having to influence up. So one thing that I think, especially as people are very nervous about AI and nervous about its impact is getting them like where it matters and saying, you know, that thing that we hate doing, like, what if we tried this? And it's about, you know, with my change management hat on, I'm thinking, showing, giving people incremental success, like little kernels of like, hey, what if we just didn't do that report that way anymore? And we connected this data source and this and had it run, right? I did this the other day with someone who was um, needing to to prepare a tax report, like for a client. And I was like, give me, give me, like, give me this, the, the, like, what's the topic? So I went into Microsoft Copilot um, and I, and I found a, a source online and I said, Hey, Copilot, you're presenting to this type of client in this type of industry, put together a three page report. And, um, and it did in seconds. And that person was like, that's my whole weekend. <laughs> and was like, well, here's your first draft, right? And by showing and, and leading um, by example, mm -hmm. as a leader and saying, you know what I just did? Instead of taking notes this meeting, I just had a tra like, it transcribed and I've got all the action items. Here you go. Like making it okay, making it safe to start in small chunks, not being like, this is AI week and we're going to radically change everything we're doing. So please get nervous. And as soon as you people hear that, that productivity just wanes, right? So that's what I would suggest is find little things, small success, and then build from there. There's an element of behavioral change, I feel like. And with that, it's always like baby steps. And then you kind of eventually get the goal that you want. But I feel like when you're just- A thousand percent. People think this is a technology transformation. The clients are coming to me for like, had like, what about the people? Like what yeah. about people? So yeah, it's around that. Okay, awesome. Um, question from Dan. Given the large amount of personal information that some of these applications might be processing, how are you mitigating the risk of biased algorithms and biased outputs? Yeah, so I, this, it's a really great question. Um, depending on your platform provider, and I wanna say this is a huge depending on your platform provider, um, us personally, like I sell a lot of Microsoft. Microsoft does not take your data anywhere outside of what's called like your container, like your, your boundary. They put a boundary around your data. You can also, um, with good la large language models, extract or say, please remove, um, please remove any PII or, or personal, personally identifiable information. And they will do that. Like a, a really good bot will be able to understand parameters, all the if then condition, conditional formatting and remove that from there. Um, in terms of bias, that is a great responsible AI ethics question. Um, you know, as someone, I'm obviously a woman of color, if you can notice, um, there's a lot of uh, solutions being built. And I just had this conversation with my boss like minutes before this call. Um, where he was asking chat, like, if you don't know that ChatGPT can create images now, um, Google Sora, because he can all, not only make um, uh, images, but also videos now. Um, but um, he had given the, the, the bot a prompt and said, like, make this image for me. 
And I asked him, I said, was it a white guy or a black guy? He's like, funny, you should ask. It gave me, it gave me a picture of both just because he happens to be white. And I was just like, well, I want to know just, and so responsible AI is a, is a big field. So those of you with that background, there's so much in terms of algorithmic um, programming and who, it, whoever is building the code, whoever is, t is training the, the machine, like the, the mach it's machine learning LLMs, whoever is in charge of that, that's what they will learn. So we can go down a path about like resumes and profiles, but it's really about that and demanding like the right uh, hands-on keyboards. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We have, we have some, some questions incoming. We got one from Manu who says, could you please discuss uh, the analytics information systems that are used or will be used in the future with these AI advancements? Um, rephrase, Manu, like what do you mean specifically if I endorse products? Okay, thank Manu. you so much, Melissa, for your great presentation. It was very informative. Um, so I have heard uh, that there are some information systems that you can utilize to make better decisions with AI advancements, but I'm not any familiarity with those information systems. And I wonder if um, you have ever used those information systems, which are based on, I mean, which are AI oriented in order to make better decisions. Yeah, so I think um, you're, I hear what you're asking. And I'm going to say it depends. I'm a good consultant. So I have to say it depends on what you're doing, it depends on the work that you're, um, you're, the decision you're trying to make. So if I'm making a decision based on what kind of service offering, let's say we're going to bring to a client, I'm going to go into my Salesforce wizard and say, you know, what have we been selling more of? What have we been, how have we been losing work? Um, and because that happens in, in, in big four is that we get outbid or whatever. And then give like, let's analyze that and then make decisions based on that. So it's really dependent on the, the information system mining. Yeah, go ahead. I can see you put your hand back up. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, so Melissa, um, specifically, I was asking about um, human resource management related decision making, because in your presentation, uh, you shared very interesting point about HR analytics and how yes. you can incorporate to make uh, hiring related decisions. Yeah. So my yeah. question was uh, specifically about HRM decision making. Yeah, so it depends, again, on the platform that you're on. Um, there is a great Canadian company and a Skyhive um, I don't own them and I don't have shares in them, but I can talk about them because they're just so cool. We discovered them. They're what they're doing right now. And this is the big, this is the hot topic in HR right now is skills mapping. Um, you know, if you'll allow me like two seconds to go down a, um, rabbit trail, um, what companies are solving for is like, who do we actually have in our employee? Um, you all have skills that you, that are known to your employer, but you also have skills that are unknown. I'll pick, take myself, for example. Um, I've been the manager of a baseball team that I don't play on because I have tiny humans who do. Um, I have that skill. They don't know that I can like organize for them. So what, what Skyhive is solving for or what known skills do you have? How, does your workforce have? And unknowns where the, where the um, employees actually sharing the skills that they have and that are measurable and observable. And then matching what's your strategic plan and then saying you actually have the right workforce. Leanne actually needs to be not only in comms, which is what I think that you said that you're in, and she also could be in like strategy for this because she's got that background. And conversely, Leanne is like, I'm on my way to CEO. And so this technology will tell Leanne, okay, instead of it being her, her manager or her leader, we'll say, Leanne, you need to have this many years of experience. And based on that job description that we've indexed, that profile, you're going to need to do this kind of training and you're going to have to do these types of projects for the next X years. Imagine that, that that whole path was cleared up for Leanne and a whole lot of stress just went away for the organization when, when Leanne's like, I'm ready for my promotion now. And they disagree with it. So that I'm, and I'm happy to chat Manu offline if you want to chat more about that, but there are those kinds of solutions that are popping up that we're actually like that example with Skyhive, PwC is actually co-selling with them so that if you hire PwC, you get a little bit of, you get a little bit of Skyhive discount. So, and that's another strategy that we're doing, uh, but happy to chat HR because low-key obsessed with that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Just 
ping me on LinkedIn. Awesome. I think we have time for one more question, Melissa. So I'm going to read out Sarah's. So Sarah says, I'm an elder millennial, young Gen Xer. I would say I'm mid-career in a senior role and have a great team of all ages. I want to be forward thinking and tech savvy. And I think I have a lot of knowledge until it comes to AI. I don't even know how to start and then how to get the team on board. How do you choose the right platform like ChatGPT, especially when working at a university where academic integrity is highly valued? Yes, yes. Um, elder millennials in the house. I'm, I'm an ex -ennial. Thank you, Sarah, for your bravery. Because um, I have no problem talking about my age any day. I'm really proud of it. Um, okay, so first of all, um, I think having an openness, again, it's a mindset. It's a mindset shift. To say like there's actually already AI in what you do is is um I don't remember is York on Google or on Microsoft right now? We're on Microsoft, like Microsoft. Microsoft? Uh, oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay, so you actually already have a little bit of of it. Um, if they haven't already purchased Copilot and you want some help selling that, let me know. But um, you actually already have AI, and these people are on Google. Like even in your phone, that predictive texting and like yeah. all of that. It's, it's already starting to be baked into uh, to that. So I don't know if York uses Bing or whomever, but there are little like free trials and free indicators of of um, of of Copilot, for example. I've seen it come up in our Teams discussions. It'll pop up at the top, and I'm like, I don't know what you are, so I just press X and yeah. go away. <laughs> okay, so if I can like just really quickly just let you know that it's like it sort of takes it takes the flow of work, it, it observes how you're working and you can ask it and say, what was the last thing that I, like, what was the document that I used to do X? And it actually, I can spend a whole other hour just talking about how to bring um, AI into your flow of work. But where it starts is your mindset, being open to solving problems. The way, like this is the cheat sheet, like no cost, no charge for this cheat sheet uh, definition of, of AI. The way the generative AI is to be used is as though you had, a brand new intern or a new start to your business. Um, so imagine that I said, Leanne, day one, um, make us a, a PowerPoint presentation about yourself. And you're like, cool. How long is it? What does it need to cover? Like, do we talk about my hobbies? Those kinds of things. So that's how you speak to, uh, that's how you should be speaking to ChatGPT or chat or uh, an, any sort of AI model. Uh, you give it a persona, say you are a, uh, comms, uh, comms, uh, mastering communications and digital, all the things Leanne said, I'm picking on you because I can see you. Um, and, uh, you're giving a presentation to university, uh, university employee group about this. They are concerned about these four things, create a PowerPoint, which you can do with Copilot and in PowerPoint, create a, a presentation that touches these, like that answers these three questions. So whenever you're Based with chat GPT, whether personally, because you can do that for free now on the web, talk to it like that. Like you're giving instructions to someone who has no clue of the outcome that you want and describe it that way. That's what we call a prompt recipe. Start there. I would say start personally, um, you know, creating things. I had my kids, um, you know, create a little screenplay about themselves. So I, they gave a jet, chat GPT prompts like, I love stuffed animals and hockey and whatever. And so it made this whole three minute play with different parts. So there are ways that you can extract value about uh, out of um, ChatGPT and AI. And considering that there you have, there's one tenant that you have to remember is that the human in the loop, and you'll see this in a lot of literature, um, H, human in the loop. So uh, H-I-T-P, H-I-T-L, sorry will never go away. There will always need to be, until bots can be sentient, which they cannot, there will always need to be a human in the loop to review, to check, to edit, and to refine. So instead of jumping on the, oh my goodness, this thing's gonna take over the world uh, wagon, be like, this thing's gonna make me awesome. Co-pilot, like it's the, it's gonna boost me. It's my rocket. Hope that helps. Again, happy to chat offline. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you everyone for submitting those questions. Um, we will be moving on to the networking portion of the event. So in a few moments, you'll be prompted to join a breakout room with two to three other alumni. I know Melissa's joining as well. Um, you'll see some icebreaker questions will be, will be broadcasted to your room. Um, I believe we'll have about 
seven minutes or so, just uh, given that we're going a bit over time uh, in that space. And then we'll be coming back to the main room for final remarks. Um, after the final remarks, we will stay in the main room here for any anyone who would like to just chat with each other. Um, feel free to have your um, mic off mute and um, you can have a free flowing conversation. So off to breakouts we go.
Alrighty. Welcome back, everyone. I see the numbers are, are increasing, so we're trickling back in. Um, hopefully, you all had a chance to connect with each other and learn a bit more about each other. Uh, this concludes our mid-career conversations uh, session for today. Thank you all for attending and a big, big thank you to Melissa for taking the time to walk us through that awesome presentation and, and getting to learn a little bit more about her and getting her um, really, really helpful advice. Um, please join us on May 13th for the next um, mid-career conversations se uh, session. More details on the speaker and session topic will be available soon on our website. Uh, we also have our next level up session called how to accelerate your career with personal branding on Tuesday, March 26. For more information, visit yourq.ca slash alumni and friends. And I believe it's just been populated in the chat. Um, for those of you who would like to, please feel free to stick around for more conversation um, and feel free to just go off mute uh, and chat with each other. And with that, thank you all for, for taking the time to uh, join us today. Uh, take care and, and enjoy the rest of your day.